Welcome to Unit 2. First, let me remind you that these unit introductory lectures are intended to be just a guide, an aid to help you with your reading assignments. They are no substitute for your reading of the actual texts of Plato, Descartes, and the Jedi Handbook. If you just repeat verbatim on your essays and exams, what is said here, you will receive a very low grade. You must give evidence that you have read and thought about the ideas and issues in the original texts. Last week, our first class or unit, we discussed absolute science, the history of philosophy, Plato, and what a Jedi is. Concerning Plato's Republic, we covered the first part, what justice is not, and reviewed the three definitions of justice and Socrates' reasons for rejecting them as false. Today, we will focus on the second part of the Republic, what justice or right is, and on three key topics in the Jedi Handbook. Polarity, the proof of the Force, and Jedi power ethics. One, we'll begin with Socrates' account of what justice really is and why the just life is far preferable to the unjust life. First, we'll treat the Ring of Gyges and Glaucon's challenge to Socrates, that Socrates prove that justice and the just life in itself, apart from rewards, social benefits, or reputation attached to it, is preferable to a life of injustice, that a life of justice and right doing alone brings happiness. Now, the point of the Ring of Gyges, which is able to make one invisible at will, and thus get away with murder, or commit any crimes, satisfy any lusts or desires, without detection or punishment, the point is that everybody would rather be unjust for it really pays. They are only just or do what is right for fear of being caught or punished or getting a bad reputation. So, in possession of the ring of Gyges, the unjust and the just person would do the same thing. All this and the challenge to Socrates is summed up on page 45 of the Republic. Quote, Now suppose there were two such magic rings, and one were given to the just man, the other to the unjust. No one, it is commonly believed, would have such iron strength of mind as to stand fast in doing right or keep his hands off other men's goods when he could, he could go to the marketplace and fearlessly help himself to anything he wanted, enter houses and sleep with any woman he chose, set prisoners free, and kill men at his pleasure. In a word, go about among men with the powers of a god. He would behave no better than the other. Both would take the same course. Surely this would be strong proof that men do right only under compulsion. No individual thinks of it as good for him personally, since he does wrong whenever he finds he has the power. Every man believes that wrongdoing pays him personally much better, and that is the truth, says Glaucon. Finally, if we are really to judge between the two lives, the only way 
is to contrast the extremes of justice and injustice. To begin with the unjust man. The unjust man, if he is to reach perfection, must be equally discreet in his criminal attempts, and he must not be found out. For the highest pitch of injustice is to seem just when you are not. So, we must endow our man with the full complement of injustice. We must allow him to have secured a spotless reputation for virtue while committing the blackest of crimes. Now, set beside this paragon, the just man in his simplicity and nobleness. He, he must be stripped of everything but justice and denied every advantage the other enjoyed. Doing no wrong, he must have the worst reputation for wrongdoing to test whether his virtue is proof against all that comes of having a bad name. And under this lifelong imputation of wickedness, let him hold on his course of justice, unwavering to the point of death. And so, when the two men have carried their justice and injustice to the last extreme, we may judge which is the happier. Next, Socrates proceeds to show what justice really is. Why? In order to answer our key question. Now, since it is easier to see what something is in a small thing, the soul, by first seeing it in a large thing, the state, Socrates first constructs an ideal state and shows in what justice consists. Briefly, it turns out the state has three parts. That of the rulers, the guardians, the police and military, and the citizens who are workers, whose corresponding virtues are wisdom, courage, and temperance. Justice in the state occurs when each part or class does its own proper function. The ruler's function is to rule over the guardians and the citizens, whose function is to let themselves be ruled by the rulers. When this happens, the state is absolutely one, harmonious, working like a well-oiled machine, with no factions, strife, or divisions. Here it is. To make one out of many is justice. The right way to be, the right way to live. Next, Socrates turns to the soul and sees that it too has three similar corresponding parts. Reason, the governing part, emotion, and desires, the largest part of the soul. And with the same corresponding virtues, wisdom, courage, and temperance. And here too, a just person or soul is one in which reason rules over emotions and desires thereby making a person absolutely one, and also divine and immortal, as we'll see, since what is one has no parts and cannot be destroyed. Plato sums this up on page 141 and the following, on the bottom. But in reality, justice is not a matter of external behavior, what you do, but of the inward or inner self, and of attending to all that is, in the fullest sense, a man's proper concern. The just man does not allow the several elements in his soul to usurp one another's functions. He is indeed one who sets his house in order by self-mastery, 
and discipline, coming to be at peace with himself and bringing into tune those three parts, like the terms in the proportion of a musical scale, C, E, G, the highest and lowest notes and the mean between them, with all the intermediate intervals. Only when he has linked these three parts together in well-tempered harmony and has made himself one man instead of many, will he be ready to go about whatever he may have to do, whether it be making money, satisfying bodily wants, or business transactions, or the affairs of state. In all these fields, when he speaks of just and honorable conduct, he will mean the behavior that helps to produce and preserve this habit of mind. What habit? Oneness and harmony. And by wisdom, he will mean the knowledge which presides over such conduct. Any action whatsoever which tends to break down this habit will be for him unjust, and the notions governing it he will call ignorance and folly. Plato goes on. Uh, so what is injustice? This must surely be a sort of civil strife among the three elements of the soul whereby they usurp and encroach upon one another's functions. And some one part of the soul rises up in rebellion against the whole, such as one powerful passion or desire which takes over the whole soul, claiming a supremacy to which it has no right because its nature fits it only to be the servant of the ruling principle, reason. Such turmoil and aberration we shall identify with injustice. Also intemperance, cowardice, and ignorance, and in a word, with all wickedness. So, here it is, the conclusion. Justice is produced in the soul like health in the body. By establishing the elements concerned in their natural relations of control and subordination of the lower under the higher. The lower under the higher. Whereas injustice is like disease and means that this natural order is inverted. So now, says Socrates, it only remains to consider which is the more profitable course. To do right and live honorably, and be just, whether or not anyone knows what manner of man you are, or to do wrong and be unjust, provided that you can escape the chastisement which might make you a better man. And uh, Glaucon joins in, but really, Socrates, it seems to me ridiculous to ask that question now that the nature of justice and injustice has been brought to light. People think that all the luxury and wealth and power in the world cannot make life worth living when the bodily constitution is going to rack and ruin. And are we to believe that when the very principle whereby we live is deranged and corrupted, life will be worth living? so long as a man can do as he will and wills to do anything rather than to free himself from vice and wrongdoing and to win justice and virtue. Yes, I reply, it is a ridiculous question. So, clearly, the just life is preferable to the unjust life why? Since justice is to health, as injustice is to disease. In our next unit, we'll find out how you can achieve justice, live the just life, and become immortal. Two, we'll now turn to the Jedi Handbook. First, the important principle of polarity and the unity of opposites. 
This is on page 74. <clears throat> Simply stated, you can't have one without the other. Up without down. Inner, outer. Male, female. Consciousness, matter. Subject, object. Self, other. Me, you. The bar magnet, according to Schelling and others, is the key to everything, to all the secrets of the universe. It clearly demonstrates the unity of opposites or polarity. Now imagine the bar magnet. Here we go. The bar magnet. This is North Pole. This is South Pole. Plus, minus. Okay? These are the opposites. North, South. Inner, outer, female, male. Now, where is the unity? The unity of these opposites. Yeah. Here it is. And here is the proof that you can't have one, the North Pole, or man, without the other, a woman. Just break the magnet in half, in two. Crack. Right? One, you don't have a North Pole in one piece and a South Pole in the other. Both pieces have a North and a South Pole. The two opposites are inseparable. Two, this further reveals that prior to breaking the magnet, the opposites, North and South Pole, okay, coexisted in the same one indivisible point which is truly amazing and revelatory. Lastly, we have Jedi Power Ethics. And this is found on page 222. And it's based on Plato's divided line, like everything. And as ethics, it shows, like Plato, what is the right way to be and live. How you can be all you can be <clears throat> and release absolute power and ability into your life. This happens when you've made yourself one and have achieved unity. According to power or priority ethics, you have to have one supreme goal or end of life which is Jedi and the Jedi Order. That is, the Jedi Order as a totally healed, functioning world, which includes yourself as a Jedi, a fully actualized person. This goal or end is your number one above the divided line, and your number two, which is below the divided line, is everything else you do, such as money, career, entertainment, friends, project, goals, and which can only be means to number one, your true end. And also, you never let a number two take the place of number one, no matter what it is. Of course, the secret is only number one exists. the Jedi Order, the one eternal reality. All number twos exist within the number one, the one reality. In other words, Plato's cave is an illusion. The sense material world has no true being. Also important is that you must Jedi, quote, all your number twos, that is, find a way to connect them and make them serve your number one. This is how absolute unity, power, and ability is achieved. We'll end this unit with a reading of the Jedi Oath and a passage from Jedi Power Ethics. This is on page 222. Quote, I, at this moment of my life, 
commit 100% to healing the world. I truly want to be a Jedi, rather to wake up to the fact that I am a Jedi right now. And I want to help realize the amazing Jedi Order. I will from this day forward live as if the Jedi Order and the balance, balance of the force, exists now. It does. And as if the dark side or cave is indeed an illusion and does not exist. It does not. And as if I am a Jedi right now. You are. I will make the Jedi Order the number one priority of my life, and I will use parts two and three of the Jedi Code to help me grow in knowledge and love and live up to this sacred oath. Uh, one passage from Jedi Power Ethics, just below. <clears throat> Noble reader, <clears throat> what is presented here and in part three is designed to help you become pointed. That is, fulfill the Jedi Oath and live the greatest life imaginable, the Jedi life, and be maximally effective in bringing balance to the Force in your world. As we saw, the truth the unity of opposites, teaches that unity is fundamental and trumps difference, opposites, and multiplicity. Thus, the task of education, getting out of the cave, or balance, is for you to transcend multiplicity and not leave it as it is. For it keeps you in a self that is divided and fragmented, anxious, Pulled in many different directions, with unfulfilled desires, living in time and towards death. Right again. You transcend this egoic self by focusing on and coming to realize <clears throat> the unity underlying <clears throat> all the multiplicity in your life and in the universe. The fact is that the more unity you experience, the more power in your life. Hence, Jedi power ethics. Again, to repeat, in the next unit, we will learn how to attain justice, right, the goal of life, and become immortal. Thank you.